I'm sure today it's easy to remember that one of the realities of life on earth is the passage of time. Maybe that's always easy to remember. The earth turns and creates our days and nights. The earth travels around the sun and shapes the changing seasons. Summer to fall, to winter to spring. The weather, the angle of the sun, trees glowing the color of copper, a blossoming daffodil, the shifting alignment of the stars and planets all mark the passage of time. But what is time? We always seem to want more of it. Can we get more of it than we usually have? To quote Doctor Who, <laughs> people assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually from a nonlinear, subject, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly timey whiny stuff. So today, let's explore space and time, and we'll be begin with a quick trip back to 1905 to visit Albert Einstein. Einstein developed his special theory of relativity in 1905, and then he expanded it to general relativity in 1916. As a first-year college student, I learned something about Albert Einstein's theory when I needed more time to write a term paper. The principle is very simple. When you want time to move more slowly, it seems to speed up. How many of you are familiar with that phenomenon? <laughs> well, Einstein's theory offered some fairly provocative ideas about time, how it works, and how different it really is from our perceptions. It's a profound theory that remains meaningful more than 100 years later, which is quite an achievement. And so this morning, I'm going to invite us all to consider just three principles from Einstein's theory. And these principles interest me for reasons that go beyond the mere science of time. So stay tuned. The three principles are time and gravity, time and motion, and relativity. So the first principle is the relationship between time and gravity. So Einstein's theory predicts that time moves more slowly at the bottom of a gravity well. Another way to say this is that objects tend to move toward regions where time goes by more slowly. Now we are on Earth, and to us, we're at the bottom of a gravity well, and so objects tend to move towards the Earth where time moves more slowly whether it's a sweet potato or me falling off my bicycle. <laughs> so according to this principle, the sweet potato moves towards the gravity well, the region where time moves more slowly. So does this principle mean that a clock at the bottom of the Empire State Building and the clock at the top will differ? Well, yes, it does, theoretically. The clock at the bottom will tick more slowly and the one of the, at the top will tick faster. But though the Empire State Building is pretty tall, the difference in the speed of time is far too small to notice. Yet scientists can measure the difference between two clocks if one is on a sidewalk in New York and the other is on a satellite in orbit around the Earth. Not only can scientists measure the difference, but satellites are built with internal timing devices that routinely use Einstein's math to adjust for the difference. So what was just a provocative theory more than 100 years ago is now built into the commonplace system that allows my phone's GPS to communicate with a telecommunication satellite and give me accurate directions despite the difference in the speed at which time moves on the Earth and up where the satellite is. Time and gravity. 
So we have that first principle. Time passes more slowly if we stay near the earth. You look a little skeptical. (laughs) But it is scientifically proven, unlike so many of my other theories. And now we go on to the second principle, the relationship between time and motion. Now, we know intuitively, this is probably the only thing we know intuitively that is accurate about time. We know intuitively that time and space are related because to measure speed, we talk about the distance covered over time. A car, we might say, goes 60 miles per hour in eight seconds. But what's not so intuitive is Einstein's conclusion about the relationship between time and motion. Motion through space affects the passage of time. It affects the speed at which time passes. So this means that time literally runs more slowly for the person who is moving. If a moving person held a clock, the clock would tick more slowly. Now, Louise Alcorn has volunteered. If you look back there, there she is. Now, come on forward, Louise. Louise is, is, she's moving through time and space. And so, because she's moving, the clock ticks more slowly. So, I've got a clock here, and if it was the same as the clock when Louise had it back there, because my clock is standing still, it's, the, it's time doesn't change. But Louise, at least in theory, uh, her clock is going to be ticking more slowly because she's moving faster than I was. Now, let, let's delve into this just a little bit more. <laughs> let's say that, let's see, Louise, why don't you stand over to the side? Okay, so we're now in different places, but we have an equal Einsteinian Einsteinian value in our, what we're gonna call this our space-time value. And we're gonna say that that value equals an arbitrary 100. This space-time value is made up of speed through space and speed through time. It's like x plus y. And whether we move or not, our space-time value, this is the key, is always equal to 100. So now, as long as Louise and I both stand still, we're moving at the same speed through space, because we're on the Earth and we're moving at its speed through space, and we're also moving at the same speed through time. But if I continue standing still and Louise starts moving, Louise's (laughs) space-time value still equals 100, just like mine. But because Louise is in motion, her speed through space has increased. Stop right there for a moment, Louise. The only way when Louise is moving for her space-time value to stay at 100 is if her speed through time decreases. So if we're both holding clocks, start up again, Louise, and Louise is moving, my clock will continue ticking at the same speed while Louise's clock moves more slowly. Now, in our normal, everyday lives, these differences are so tiny that we don't notice them. And I hope our clocks actually say the same time. Um, So, obviously, why should we believe Einstein's theory? We can't ever notice this difference. And when, in 1905, there was no way to test his theory. Ah, but now we fast forward to 1971. In 1971, jet planes were commonplace. So scientists got the idea of testing Einstein's theory with a simple experiment. They used two atomic clocks. And by the way, each of our clocks is an atomic clock uh, timed with the uh, atomic clock in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, And one clock stayed still, and that's me. My clock is gonna stay still. And the other went with Louise on board of a jet plane that flew around the world. So give her a little applause as she... (laughs) All right, and the plane is coming in for a landing. And when the plane did land and the two clocks were compared, there was a measurable difference between the clocks. Louise's clock was behind mine. The clock that was on the plane 
calculated time is moving slower than the clock that was on the ground. Time passed more slowly for the clock that was in motion. Thank you, Louise. In another thought experiment, Einstein imagined two brothers. One gets on a rocket and travels rapidly to another star and back. And for that brother, only a few months have passed. And for the brother that stayed on Earth, years have passed. How many of you remember hearing about that? The twin brothers, one gets on the rocket. <laughs> now back to the college student hoping for more time to finish a term paper that's due in a week. Now, the only way to take advantage of the unusual characteristics of time would be to put the professor on the rocket ship <laughs> for a week. Of course, that's a week determined from the professor's point of view, so the student would have perhaps years to complete the term paper. Sadly to say, this solution doesn't have much practical value. So to sum it up, the principle on time and motion is that time passes more slowly if we keep moving. Now the third principle, relativity. This is where you might want to fasten your seatbelts. So one of the reasons Einstein's theory uses the word relativity in its name is that it's impossible to talk about time, especially about his ideas of time, unless we talk about one perspective on time in relationship to another perspective on time, because the passage of time is relative. For Louise on the jet plane or the college professor on the rocket ship, time seems to be passing normally. It's only in relation to my clock here on the ground that Louise's clock on the jet plane seems to be moving more slowly, literally ticking more slowly. And it's only in relation to the college student's time on Earth that the professor's week on the rocket can be seen to take less time than the many weeks that pass for the student. So whatever time is, even Einstein, couldn't describe it except relationally, in terms of one perspective compared to another, which is so appropriate, because our human sense of time is also relative. And inevitably, we evaluate time in relation to a human lifetime. We look up at a redwood, hundreds of feet high, touch it gently with awe, this is a living being that sprouted two millennia ago. We stand on the crest of the Grand Canyon and gaze with wonder at the curving layers of rock exposed by a river's progress over millions of years. We look at a human infant, touch the tiny fingers and toes, and know that just 15 years later, that newborn will be taller than we are and much more stubborn. <laughs> we clasp the hands that gave us life, not so many years ago, really, and bid farewell. Time is relative. So there, in a nutshell, we have the science of time. But what meaning can we make of this for our lives and the lives of the people we love? We might resolve to use these scientific principles to live longer. If time moves more slowly on the Earth's surface and when we are in motion, we might resolve to stay on the ground, not go up real high, and, and keep moving so that we would age more slowly. Of course, the physical difference might not be very much, though if we were persistent in this particular resolution to stay on the ground and keep moving, our personal atomic clock might tick measurably slower. We'd certainly be healthier. But in the philosophical sense, a resolution to stay on the ground and keep moving would be good even if it doesn't make much practical difference in the amount of time that we have and in the rate of our phys physical aging. So the three 
scientific physical principles of time are time passes more slowly if we stay near the Earth, time passes more slowly if we keep moving, and time is relative, we can translate those into philosophical principles and extend the meaning to our own lives. And we have these principles. Stay grounded. Keep moving. And remember that a lifetime is about relationships. Stay grounded. So in the physical sense, time moves more slowly in regions where the gravity is higher. So stay near the ground, stay grounded. Gravity is important in life too. Not gravity in the sense of never laughing. I know you would never think that of me. <laughs> but gravity as in seriousness of purpose, of living intentionally. We don't know how much time we have. But for most of us, it's not long enough. To make the most of the time we have, we must stay grounded, to stay in touch with the values and the purposes that matter. And one of the ways that we stay grounded is to gather here in this sanctuary each week for just one hour out of the week's 168 hours. We gather in community to consider what is worthy what brings meaning and purpose to our lives in the oldest sense of the word worship. This observation of the Sabbath is, a profound, is in a profound sense the intentional setting aside of time from the workaday world. The Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel said that six days a week we live under the tyranny of things in space on the Sabbath, we try to become attuned to the holiness in time. Holiness in the sense of finding life's meaning and purpose at our heart's center. Time moves more slowly when we're grounded. When we participate in what is eternal in time by turning from the results of creation to the mystery of creation. For this one hour together, we gather to hold side by side what is worthy and what is mysterious. By this practice, we ground ourselves in a way that reaches beyond the clock's mere 60 seconds of time. The second physical principle of time is that it passes more slowly if we keep moving. In the philosophical sense, that translates to keep moving. There are times of the year, and we're near upon them, when cold and darkness invite us to reduce our activity level, to self-isolate, to slow down. There are years when it seems that spring will never come. At any time of the year, unwanted change can abruptly demoralize, derail, and discourage if depression or despair or bad weather issue a signal to shut down, to shut others out, continue Einstein's, consider Einstein's observation, not about time, but about human experience. He said, the human experience of separation is both a delusion and a prison. Isolation is a kind of disconnectedness that robs us of both time and beauty. And so he encouraged people to engage with life, to win free from the prison of separation by widening our circle of compassion and embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature. This was a wise man. If we stay engaged with life, if we reach out and keep reaching out, and keep bringing in, if we keep moving, in a very real sense, we have more time. Because it's that engagement that gives life its richness and its vitality. Relativity. So physics teach us, teaches us that time is relative. And that's true for life as well. What one person experiences and observes is actually different from the observations and experiences of others. Perspectives differ, perceptions differ. So what's a lifetime? It's the time 
when we are alive and in relationship. We create meaning for our lives, not only through our own experiences, but through the insights and perspectives of others. This philosophical parallel to relativity is relationship. Robert Frost once wrote a short poem called A Time to Talk. It evokes the pace of an earlier era, but it's relevant to us today because it expresses that awareness of the human inclination to become ungrounded, to be caught up in all the work that is to be done, and the sense of time's rapid passage. It's especially true today. I certainly feel it. The sense of urgency and time's passage that can pull me off center. And in this little poem, which feels to me like a true story, the poet chooses to stay grounded, to stay connected to what is important in life. So here's this little poem. When a friend calls to me from the road and slows his horse to a meaning walk, I don't stand still and look around on all the hills I haven't hoed and shout from where I am, what is it? No, not as there is time to talk. I thrust my hoe in the mellow ground, blade end up and five feet tall and plod. I go up to the stone wall for a friendly visit. In this poetic moment, the friendship calls and the poet chooses, chooses to use the time to be in relationship. Good people in a human lifetime think often about what they can give to others. We give gifts of material things. We give of our financial resources. We share our talents. But of all the things we might give to one another, to our family, to our friends, to the world, it boils down to time. It's actually all we have. It takes time to earn the money for financial resources, to give those gifts of cash or material things. Sharing a talent takes time to develop and time to offer. Staying in relationship takes time. In the end, time is all we have and we never know how much. How we spend the time we have determines the true richness, variety, and depth of a human life. We must learn to cherish every moment. When my dad was in his last few years, I often visited him in his Alzheimer's residence. On one of the first warm days of spring, we sat in his favorite place, outdoors. Dad was worried about something, and with his aphasia, it was hard to tell what was bothering him. He searched for the words, but he was fretting. And finally, in frustration, he threw his head back and said, oh! Then in a different tone, and still looking up at the sky, he said, Oh, look, so I looked. The sky was the bluest blue. The sun was golden. The trees with their delicate branches shifted slightly in the gentle wind and it was spring and on each end of a branch, tiny little buds trembled just on the edge of leaf. Dad said, clear as a bell. Here I am worrying when this is life. This is life. It was a moment of recognition that lifted us together to a holy place. It was a place where time moved in a way that Einstein's equations do not describe, where time wasn't measurable by the tick of a clock the tick-tock of human contrivance. Flowing around us was a lifetime of human connections with one another, with family and friends, with all people, with all creatures of the earth, the beautiful earth, the stars, 
Time was boundless, eternity in a grain of sand. This is life, the very life of life. Stay grounded, keep moving. Remember that a lifetime is about relationships because this is life. <laughs>